Okay, lecture the 14th, water and food structure. Uh, there's the topics, fairly short list, but quite a lot in these topics. Uh, starting off with something which keeps coming up, hydrogen bonding. Uh, just a reminder of the bar structure of oxygen. As you know, this is a simplification as electrons are arranged in atomic orbitals that hybridize when forming bonds to form molecular orbitals. Um, the key consequence is that water forms two non-bonding lone pairs. These are important for the structure of the water molecule, the properties of water, and in particular its interactions with other molecules. Um, so, a hypothetical question, which I'm sure we can figure out what the answer to. Uh, what other molecule is water most likely to associate with? In almost all circumstances, that's going to be other water molecules. Um, other species will be vastly outnumbered. Uh, statistically, water molecules, therefore, are more likely to bump into each other into other water molecules, which is not to say that water's interactions with other species are not in, very important. They are, of which more in the rest of this lecture. Uh, a couple of definitions there, which you may or may not remember. I'm sure you do. Intermolecular, between different molecules. Int intramolecular, uh, inside one molecule. Um, these weak interactions between water molecules are called hydrogen bonds. Bond is quite small. Uh, okay, yeah. so I'm sure you can remember hydrogen bonds. They're easily broken as well. Uh, everything you want to know about hydrogen bonding in terms of uh, the numbers, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, we'll notice that the energy to break the bond is about a tenth of that required to break a covalent bond, so not very much. In a hypothetical universe where there was no hydrogen bonding, water would be a gas at normal temperatures and pressures, and it's difficult to see how complex water-based chemistry, let alone life, could develop under such circumstances. If you compare it to other hydrides, uh, water is a hydride of oxygen, uh, such as ammonia and especially HF, hydrofluoric acid, they don't show hydrogen bonding. Um, but they show a little bit, beg your pardon, they show a little bit of hydrogen bonding, but not enough to make them liquid under normal conditions. But then if you look at methane and uh, boron hydride, they don't do hydrogen bonding and are gases down to very low temperatures. So water is a liquid at standard temperature and pressure. Uh, it boils 100 degrees centigrade at sea level because the energy that has been imparted in water is more than enough to make the hydrogen bonds that keep it as a liquid. As mentioned, lone pairs influence the structure of water, which is a bent molecule as a consequence. It also has a dipole moment. When atoms in the molecule share electrons unequally, they create what is called a dipole moment. This occurs when one atom is more electronegative than another result in that atom pulling more tightly on the shared pair of electrons, or when one atom has a lone pair of electrons, such as in water, and the difference of electronic negativity vector, that is the direction, points in the same way. Uh, as we've mentioned, one of the most common examples is the water molecule, uh, and the differences in electronegativity in the lone pairs give oxygen a partial negative charge, uh, the oxygen water a partial negative charge, and each hydrogen a partial positive charge, with considerable consequences. And of course, the vast majority of biological molecules have a dipole moment, including proteins and nucleic acids, as illustrated here. Uh, back to water. In the liquid form, it's loosely arranged in a tetrahedral arrangement, held together by hydrogen bonding. You say it loosely, uh, these bonds form and break all of the time. Um, it becomes more fixed and open on freezing, which is one of the reasons why soft fruits rupture on freezing. Uh, there's more space taken up by the water molecules, basically. Uh, we'll have a look at a iceberg a little bit later on, I'm sure with the next slide, but it isn't. Um, water does form more complex structures, but very short-lived indeed. Uh, 12 picoseconds, so a picosecond is one trillionth of a second, uh, which isn't very long, obviously. These associations are continually forming as well as breaking, so they do contribute to water's physical properties at normal temperature. Uh, this, on the other hand, is nonsense. Uh, yeah, hexagonal water. As noted, water forms quasi-stable structures, uh, but it lasts a very short time. A very, very, very short time. Um, even bigger structures have been identified by X-ray diffraction in water nanodrops. Uh, such as icosahedral water clusters, they are thought to contain around 400 water molecules, and it's quite hard to work out what's happening inside the structure. 
again, they are said to be quasi stable. I can't remember how long they last, but I'm guessing it isn't very long. Uh, there's a paper link through here if you want to have a look. Uh, paper link via the, via, the, via the image, as is often the case. Um, there's lots of different types of ice, um, potentially 18 different polymorphs. Polymorphs are materials that have the same chemical composition but different structural arrangements. What was many solid phases, that is say ices, which are mostly of interest to physicists. No, there, I guess there's some applications in food. Uh, if you click on the link, if you're interested, there's more information there as usual. Okay, back to uh, something we mentioned a little bit a, a few moments ago. Uh, water at ordinary temperatures contracts and increases in density as it is cool, cool like most substances, but about 4 degrees C it reaches a maximum density and then decreases as it approaches the freezing point. Uh, which is why icebergs float, at least some of the iceberg floats. Uh, this obviously has implications for the storage of food, especially liquids. You wouldn't freeze bottles of liquids without uh, bad things happening. Yeah, so what is a complex substance? It de dissociates to form hydrogen and hydroxy ions. The hydrogen ion, which is really, if you think about it, a proton, associates with another water molecule to form a hydroxonium ion, sometimes called a hydrated proton. Uh, the water needs to be slightly acidic, for, uh, at least, for this to happen. Um, okay, so that was just another example of association. So water binding in food, getting on to sort of quantifiable stuff, I guess. Uh, food chemists often lack consistency in their nomenclature, unfortunately. Uh, water binding is one example, as cool to note here. Lots of factors influence it as well. So here's a definition. Bound water is that which is retained in the structure of the food. Uh, so more in a moment. Yeah, so here are the main classes of uh, bound water with free water at the bottom. Uh, you can see it's a, it's a relatively small amount. And it does, of course, depend on what the food is. Uh, things which contain a lot of salt will be obviously very different th things that don't contain a lot of salt. Um, as we know, proteins fall specifically to hydrophobic groups while exposing hydrophilic ones to surrounding water. And the water lane covering the macromolecule is part of the bound water. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the concept is so important. Uh, if you have a look at the graph, you'll note the relationship between how closely water is bound and water activity. So it's a very key concept which relates directly to things like food safety. Okay, water holding capacity, the ability of food to trap water. It's obviously very important, contributes to the mouthfeel of the food and a range of other things. Uh, it defines the ability of food to hold inherent or added water throughout fabrication, processing and storage. Um, a range of molecules such as pectin can, can exist with this. Uh, pectin is a structural polysaccharide found in plant cell walls. Uh, its main use in food is as a jelly agent, a thickener, and as a stabiliser, all associated with increasing water holding capacity. Okay, the main class of interaction. These are the main classes, and we'll look at them uh, each fairly briefly in the next few slides. Uh, ions and ionic groups, as you might expect, ions having full charges form the strongest interactions. This is one of the reasons why salt reduces the water activity of food very significantly. And I mentioned that, note this is a three-dimensional structure, so it's more like a, 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 a sphere, the a sphere surrounding the sodium chloride with, with water. Uh, here's one example relating uh, salt, salting in Welsh curing. It's a method of curing bacon that was developed by the Harris family around 1843. Carcasses are injected with a mixture of salt and sal saltpetre, that is potassium nitrate. Then Libri sprinkle the same mixture and stack for 21 days. Uh, and this is associated with increasing the water binding capacity. So contributes to ham having a, a sort of moist, moist, moist mouthfeel. Uh, another example, papain, a prolytic enzyme, has no charge, but has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic reasons. Hence, it and all proteins associate with water. So there's a picture there of papain forming bridges with water. I'll stay here. Uh, yeah, so non-polar substances, a little reminder, we mean hydrophobic molecules and parts of large molecules which are hydrophobic. As we've noticed on, on many occasions, this is a key driver in protein folding. 
It takes more energy involved, but it is a, quite an important thing in the structure of food with its relationship to water. In the news this week, uh, down here, uh, an artificial intelligent network developed by Google AI offshoot DeepMind has made a great leap forward in solving one of biology's grandest challenges, determine a protein 3D sh- straight from its amino acid structure, uh, which is quite a development. Some of these proteins have potentially 10 to 100 different potential arrangements, only one of which actually works, uh, driven by, the folding being driven by hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions as you've discussed in biochemistry and other modules. Okay, to wrap up this, determining water content, which are a number of methods. Uh, These are the main methods used, as usual, chemical analysis. Many other approaches are available. Uh, Gravimetric methods are a technique through which the amount of an analyte, in this case water, can be determined through the measurements of its mass. In these methods, water is removed by various approaches and a simple calculation done. And we've certainly done this sort of thing uh, many times. Uh, Freeze drying is a good way of doing this. Uh, Freeze drying, also known as lyophilization or cryodesiccation, is a low temperature dehydration process that involves freezing the product, lowering the pressure and then removing the ice by sublimation. That is to say, the ice is converted from solid to gas without going through the liquid phase. Uh, This is in contrast to dehydration by most conventional methods of evaporate water using heat, uh, which will, of course, damage the food. Uh, Freeze drying is an effective way of dehydrating food. Uh, It is important for food applications, including pot noodle type products and dehydrated meals for hikers, for example, and many other applications. There's a phase diagram there, which you may not have come across. It's just a way of representing the physical states of a substance under different conditions of temperature and pressure. Um, takes me back to my old physical chemistry lecture days. Okay, here's the process. Uh, we have a freeze dry in the food lab and we have used to make uh, healthy pot noodles, for example. Yeah, Dean Stark's a method commonly used to measure water content in items such as bread. Uh, it's a fairly crude method. You just basically boil off the water, condense it and measure how much it is in something which looks like a bit like the measuring part of a burette. Uh, there's a video here which will walk you through the process. Uh, well, 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 worth having a look at. It, it eventually starts talking about chemistry type stuff, which in your trips and things like that, which aren't particularly relevant here. But it's worth looking at just to see the basic process of how Dean and Stark's apparatus works. Um, Carl Fisher is probably the most important water analysis method in the food industry and, and beyond. Um, we'll look at the chemistry briefly in a second. It uses... Uh, substances like pyridine, which is deeply unpleasant, and also sulfur dioxide, which is equally unpleasant, are uh, usually done by an automatic machine these days. Uh, they are standard for the analysis. It's good, good for a number of reasons. Better accuracy, everything's kept dry, and it keeps the deeply unpleasant reagents safely contained. Yeah, so see this video for more details on the Carl Fisher titration and the chemistry behind it. Okay, that's all, folks.